Jeff Jarbarpkowski and James Barry are playing video games. It's a late Wednesday night, November 17, 2016 in Loxahatchee, Florida. Jeff had been rooming at James's house, as was usual. What wasn't usual was the good news James had brought to Jeff that night. It will free James from a burden that had weighed on him for many months. Meanwhile, outside the home, a car sits idling on the road. The person inside the car is looking through James's room. Just after midnight, the person steps outside of the car and goes to the door. James is alerted to their presence and confronts them. About 30 minutes later, I need an ambulance right away. Somebody came in and stabbed my son and he's leaving. Jeff is jolted awake by a sound out in the hallway. Moments later, a staggering James comes through the bedroom door, blood pooling from his neck. James was able to tell Jeff to call for help before he collapsed. Sometime later, hearing the sounds outside their bedroom, James's mother Nicola Berry and her partner Guy Hand come into the room. Guy tries to perform CPR while Nicola calls 911. Uh, who came in and stabbed your son? Right now, right now, he's leaving. My... Okay, okay, who who is it? It's my son. Dad. He's he's stabbed in the right shoulder. Okay, how? He's dead. Please get a get him, please. Ma'am, I have I have help on the way. S O U on the line. Yeah. Okay. What is that vein, guy? But by his neck. His jugular his jugular vein. Okay. Okay, do you have a, someone have a cloth to put pressure on? Yes, we have to try it right now. Please get okay. him. Is he breathing? You don't know? No, no, no. I, need, I, I need to know if he's, if he's not breathing. Okay. No, sir, sir, I have them on the way. I need to know if he's, if he's not, he's unconscious, right? He's unconscious, yes. Is he, bre is he breathing? No, he's not breathing. The CPR is of no use. James Barry was gone. James had suffered seven stab wounds, the fatal blow to his chest severing two arteries. When police arrived, they were met by Guy and Nicola, who had called other family members, including James's biological father, Jim, to come to the home. The police noted blood spatter on the floor, the hallway wall, the inside of the bedroom wall, on a laundry basket, and on the bed near where James collapsed. It was a bloody scene. There was also no forced entry. Police took immediate note of two odd things. That Guy Hand had blood on his hands and that the bloody knife with James's hair on it was found in the kitchen near the sink, away from James's body. Jeff had told police that the knife was at one point on the floor. The knife also looked like there was an attempt to clean it. Guy admitted that he moved the knife away out of instinct. While the bloodied hands could be explained by the chest compressions, police weren't so sure about the knife being moved. Meanwhile, police continued to search the residence for evidence. On a table in the back screen patio, they discovered a cell phone with a pink case. They now needed a search warrant to access it. James Barry was born on May 28, 1995 to Nicola and Jim. From a very young age, the shy and soft-spoken freckled faced boy had a fascination with animals, especially reptiles, birds, and butterflies, creatures that were generally defenseless. So much so that he even avoided stepping on bugs. He was therefore a natural fit at pet store Tanks a lot in Lantana, where he worked. He was in the middle of a transition to a new pet store when he was murdered. The graduate of Seminole Ridge Community High School was attending Palm Beach State College. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do, but told his parents he was confident he would find his way. He was described as loving, kind, caring, thoughtful, selfless, intelligent, and sweet. He was the kind of person who was afraid of saying the wrong thing and upsetting someone the kind of person who put others before himself. 
Jim recalled a time that he was making himself a crunchy peanut butter sandwich and decided to make the same for James for school. Later, when his stepmother Trish asked him if he really likes crunchy peanut butter, or if he preferred creamy, he said creamy, but that he didn't want to hurt his dad's feelings. As his father would say, he didn't have a mean bone in his body. He didn't do drugs, didn't drink, didn't disobey rules, never broke curfew, and focused hard on school. He was the ideal son and brother. The only time his father heard him curse was in the heat of playing video games, an activity he loved doing with friends and family. He and Jim would text each other almost every day. The family had a very close bond. They communicated with each other regularly and went out to family vacations together. He loved Comic-Con, anime, green space, and the video game League of Legends, on which he met people. The last time he updated his Facebook page, he noted that he was single. But that wasn't always the case. Meanwhile, while the police had their eye on Guy Hand, they also had surveillance footage of a white Toyota driving on Glasgow Road at 12.25 a.m. and leaving from James's residence at 12.52 a.m. on the night James was murdered. That time was consistent with the 911 call placed by Nicola. About 50 minutes after the 911 call, the car's Sun Pass, which is a transponder for toll roads, was activated as it traveled north on the Florida Turnpike. Jim arrives on the scene. He immediately tells police that they should probably talk to James's girlfriend, Melanie Eam, for information. Meanwhile, police put out a bulletin for the vehicle and traveled to Melanie's parents' home. The parents told police that they were showering when they heard knocking on the door. But when Melanie's father came down to answer, he saw Melanie take off in the vehicle. They were visibly concerned about her welfare and told police that they had tried calling her but didn't get an answer. They did tell police that she often stayed at her aunt's place in Silver Spring, Maryland. A day later, on November 18, police get a call from a man named Mongol Uk, Melanie's cousin. He was calling about the white Toyota, which was parked at his house. Local police and a surveillance team were sent to a townhouse on a cul-de-sac in Silver Spring, Maryland, a nearly 15-hour drive from Loxahatchee, Florida. When police knock, Melanie answers. Police immediately notice she seems emotionally fragile. She then begins crying. Police are not sure what to make of the moment. They were not made aware of what happened at the Barry home at the time. They were only told to do a welfare check. But Melanie doesn't know that. Born on May 8, 1996, Melanie Eam was considered as having a dynamic personality with a very quiet, calm demeanor who didn't talk a lot. She was enrolled at Palm Beach State College, where she was studying psychology. The quiet girl spent some of her time playing video games, specifically the wildly popular League of Legends online role-playing game. It was there that she would meet James. Hellraiser was the name. It was Melanie's online alias on League of Legends. James and Melanie shared a love of the game and gaming in general. They chatted on the game's communications app. They got to know each other. It was around the summer of 2014 when they decided to take the next step and go out on their first date. James was so excited about meeting Melanie that he immediately told his father Jim about her. One of their first dates was at the South Florida Fair. He sent a photo from the fair to his father. Jim took Melanie into their family like she was one of their own. James loved her, so the family did too. That's how much the family loved James. They loved Melanie because she loved their son, and he loved her. Nearly every picture and video that James sent to the family included Melanie. Melanie was there celebrating Jim's mother's birthday, standing right next to James. Melanie was there at every family gathering. Melanie stayed at Jim's home numerous times with James including during Hurricane Matthew, during which James helped put up hurricane shutters at Melanie's home. For nearly the entire relationship, Melanie stayed at James's house four to five nights a week. They appeared inseparable. James's sister Alexandra did have her reservations about Melanie, describing her as a bit possessive. Melanie wanted to take college classes with him as they went to the same school. It felt like she needed to be with him seemingly all the time. Meanwhile, James himself was described as perhaps a bit naive and innocent with an inherent trust in people. It was not a good mix of personalities. 
It would turn out that the phone left behind on the patio table was Melanie's. Police executed the search warrant on the device, seeking out messaging apps to get an idea of what types of conversations she may have had with James. They then stumbled upon the League of Legends communications app. They found a text exchange between Melanie and James that same night. James broke off the relationship with her. In the conversation, we get a bit of a glimpse into the type of relationship that they had. It appeared Melanie simply did not leave James alone. It appeared she needed to hear from him regularly. She needed assurance constantly that he cared about her. The texts show a young man completely exhausted, his energy perhaps sapped by the figurative emotional vampire. Quote, Oh, you forgot about me, she said the night of James's murder. Nobody is 100%. You told me that just this morning. To which James replies, It might be better for us to split to do better in life and just focus on ourselves rather than worrying about each other constantly. Yes, it's something big for the both of us. Are you and me really happy? Melanie retorts, You mean waste your time. Thanks for leaving me through a league chat. I didn't expect this at all. To which James replies, Melanie, I tie my feelings better than explaining them in real life. I'm not happy at all anymore. I'm really, really, really tired. I'll talk to you in real life. James had been suffocating for the last few months of his life. He had previously broken up with Melanie for a short period, but that turned out to be more difficult than he expected. The ingredients for that mix were one part James hating confrontation and another part Melanie's inability to just let go. One day, about eight months before his murder, he came home by himself. He and Melanie had broken up for the first time. By that point, they had been together for about nine months. She cried profusely got angry and frustrated, and was in complete denial. She pleaded with James for another chance to work things out, but he just couldn't bring himself to do it. But could he ever, if not for his kind heart? It was suspected that she was jealous of James's relationship with his best friend Jeff, over which Alexandra suspected Melanie held ill will. In other words, there was competition for James's attention, it was an irrational thought. James's relationship with Jeff wasn't new. The pair had been best friends since childhood. In fact, Jeff roomed with James at Nicola's house. Melanie suspected Jeff of pushing James to break up with her. This left her uncontrollably angry. So how does Melanie deal with it? It certainly wasn't letting it go. Jeff loved fish. He kept a tank of them in Nicola's home. One day, Melanie secretly poured half a gallon of bleach in the fish tank, killing all the swimmers. Her goal? To get Jeff out of the house. Mission accomplished. Jeff moved out. The ordeal put a temporary restraint on his relationship with James. Melanie later admitted to doing the deed with no emotion, no care, and no sorry. After the breakup, Melanie became suicidal, according to her parents. Melanie's mom even went over to James's house and begged him to take her back. She told James that she didn't know if Melanie could handle it and didn't know whether she would survive it. James needed advice. Even when he couldn't take the volatility of the relationship, his heart ached for her. He spoke with his stepmother Trish. She told him that if there was something major in her that he couldn't live with, then that wasn't going to change. He told her that they had been together for nine months, which he considered a long time, even though it most certainly was not. That could have been James trying to get his brain on board with his heart. If you had even a little cold in your heart, you wouldn't look back, but James had no cold in his heart. He agreed to rekindle the relationship. Trish was right. Things didn't get better. It was three weeks before his murder that James's family started to really notice something was off with Melanie. Jim and Trish bought James his dream car, the Camaro SS. When they went to pick it up, he was elated. Melanie, not so much. 
she appeared to express no interest, much less joy, for James. It's unclear whether James and his family knew about Melanie's troubled past, but we do have the benefit of hindsight. Between 1975 and 1979, the Southeast Asian country of Cambodia was home to one of the Cold War's worst atrocities, the Cambodian Genocide. After the United States stopped bombing Cambodia during its fight against the communist Viet Cong in Vietnam, a power vacuum emerged in the Cambodian capital of Phnom Penh, which was filled by the ruthless Pol Pot and his Khmer Rouge Communist Party. In the ensuing years, between 1.5 and 3 million Cambodians, a quarter of the country's population, would be killed under the new ruling party. Among the people taken by the Khmer Rouge were Melanie's grandparents. Melanie's mother was only nine when that happened, so Melanie's parents fled to Washington, D.C. The experience left Melanie's mom suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder which would forever impact Melanie's life. Melanie's mother had difficulty controlling her mood, had regular verbal outbursts, and sought out medication for depression, Melanie's cousin would say. Up until she was 12 years old, Melanie was said to have slept in her mother's bedroom as her father slept in a separate room. There was physical abuse and domestic violence between the parents. Though the accounts are scarce and come largely from Melanie's cousin, it is said Melanie had suffered verbal and physical abuse. It is alleged that Melanie was also sexually assaulted by her mother, but Melanie's cousin said she wasn't an eyewitness to that. None of the alleged abuse was ever reported to the Florida Department of Children and Families or law enforcement, so there's no official record. It would appear her childhood impacted her later in life. By the age of 19, she was taking SSRIs, or mild antidepressants, but she wasn't consistent with it. Melanie's relationship with James appeared to serve two purposes, therefore. It gave her access to a lifestyle she wanted, a handsome and kind boyfriend with a loving family that took regular trips together, and an escape from her troubled home life. She desperately wanted to integrate into James's family, she knew the family's habits, she knew her way around the house, she baked and cooked in their kitchen. It was like she was already part of the family. Her ultimate wish was to marry James. But in the lead up to his murder, she might have felt she was losing her grip on him. Jim and Trish figured that Melanie thought the car they bought James represented James's ability to detach and give him the confidence to move on from the relationship which they thought Melanie felt was already over. Quote, she feared that she was losing control that she had over him, Jim would say. At 8.55 p.m. on November 16, 2016, Jim sent a what's up text to James. It was your typical checkup communication between father and son, but this conversation was different. Unknown to Jim, James was simultaneously breaking up with Melanie over the game chat. Not much, just thinking about myself, James replied. Jim said this was uncharacteristic of James. Jim asked whether it was related to his transition to his new job, school, his future, love, relationships. It's about my relationship, James replied. Jim told him he now has more confidence in himself, that there is not one relationship that is easy, and that he has to work at it if that's what he really wants. But James told him he wasn't happy with his well-being in it. Jim told him he had to make a change because he wanted him to be happy. James replied that the relationship had been difficult, that he tried to fix and ignore things, but he couldn't, and that the love that was once there was gone because the wounds were too deep to heal and he had to move on. He told his father that it was going to hurt a lot, but he can do it. He noted that he hated when Melanie cried and begged to have him back. This is not the first time. You can do whatever you want and we'll come out better on the other side, Jim told him, to which he agreed. 
James told him that he thinks the worst that will come out of it is that she would cry and beg him to get together. But it was over this time. I know that you are strong, Jim said. The conversation ends at 9.33pm. As this text conversation was happening, Melanie was seething. She got into her white Toyota and started driving toward James's house. James settles in for a night of gaming with Jeff. He tells Jeff that he finally broke up with Melanie for good, perhaps a sense of relief washing over him like a wave of fresh air. Around midnight, Melanie parks outside the house. Jim said she would have had a direct sight on James in his room because he would leave his blinds up. Jim speculated that she knew when everyone else would be asleep. It's unclear if Melanie texted James to bring him to the front door or if she knocked, but James's attention is called to the door where he lets Melanie in. They talk. She pleads her case to get back together, but James is firm with her. He tells her it's over. Wrong answer. Because if Melanie couldn't have James, no one could. Melanie would have known where the sharpest and biggest butcher knives were placed in the house because she was quite well acquainted with it. While the kitchen had a regular block of knives on the counter, the sharper ones were in the drawer. It just so happens that the same knife that was used to make pot roast that night would be the same one used in the attack. One account has it that when she pulled out the knife, James had already turned his back. He was stabbed in the back, the lower left abdomen, right thigh, and in the left side of his chest, which severed the two arteries that would prove fatal. He had been stabbed seven times. He had enough strength to get up and stumble through the short hallway and to the left where his bedroom was before he collapsed. In a panic, Melanie left her phone behind. Melanie had no criminal history. In that initial interview with police in Maryland, she kept saying that James broke up with her and that she didn't mean to do it. No. Okay, so is it, it just happened, I'm assuming, is that right? You didn't do it on purpose. You didn't go over there armed with that knife, because I know that knife was there when you got there. You didn't take it with you. Right? Yeah. Melanie was described by her psychologist, Dr. Heather Holmes, as someone who came across as flat. A skill of a surviving victim of sexual violence is to mentally check out, the doctor said, adding her evaluation in no way excuses what Melanie did. Heather noted that people like her vacillate between being checked out and flipping out in a rage. What this relationship meant to her was an escape, Heather noted. She wanted to leave behind her family to live with someone who had a family she much preferred. She wanted James and his lifestyle. She preyed on someone who seriously had her best interests in mind. When he finally did something to put himself before another, he was murdered for it. The state had gotten her confession on the initial recorded interview, which the defense tried to have thrown out over a Miranda dispute. That was unsuccessful. Melanie was found guilty of secondary murder. In April 2019, she was sentenced to 50 years in prison. I watched my son go unconscious and die. Every day I relive that morning and it will stay with me for the rest of my life, Nicola said in a victim impact statement. This has impacted the value of my life, my heart, my vision, my sensitivity, my belief in humanity. She bankrupted my life, also the value of my house. I cannot sell it. My mouth is so bitter, the way he was killed in his own home. Jim and Trish added, we live every day with the question of was there something that we should have seen? Was there something that we could have done differently to prevent this? We know in our hearts that the answer is no, but it still haunts us almost two and a half years later. Finally, his sister Alexandra took his loss especially hard. When she got the call that James had been killed, she said she collapsed, cried uncontrollably, and shouted. She said her mental health had declined following the murder. She said she has already suffered from severe depression, panic attacks, and thoughts of suicide. Alexandra had already been having difficulty from an abusive relationship she got out of and which James helped her with. This crime has impacted my core beliefs, my perceptions in life, destroyed my trust with people, and has also made me question at times my own faith. 
Despite her struggles, Alexandra made the best out of the circumstances. When she noticed there was a lack of services for survivors impacted by violent crime, she set up a support group called Siblings of Murdered Siblings. She noted that she hoped to quote, prevent lives from being lost from a horrific breakup by spreading awareness that domestic violence exists in men too. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate this story, which is based on secondary and primary sources. Special shout out to the reporters who kept on the story, and to you guys for engaging in the subject matter. Be good, feed the poor, and don't be Melanie Eam. Goodbye.